Hey everyone, today's video is on enterocutaneous fistulas, often abbreviated ECF. Now this is a, at first glance, a pretty niche topic that only really uh, is seen in general surgery. However, um, for one, there's at least one common pimp question that almost all of you will get on your general surgery rotation related to this topic. But also, uh, some of the principles related to fistulas and how they form and how we treat them will help illuminate some broad broadly applicable principles that apply to other aspects of medicine in addition to just general surgery or more specifically really bowel surgery. So first, as with most things in medicine, to really understand what's going on, we've got to start with the name. So first, what is a fistula? Well, a fistula is just an abnormal or surgically created, which I guess by definition is usually also abnormal, uh, passage or tract between two spaces. And then they're usually named in such a way that tells you which two spaces. So remember, the title of this talk was enterocutaneous fistulas. So cutaneous is pretty obvious. That's just the skin. And entero technically means small intestine. Um, but usually this term ECF for enterocutaneous fistula is used more broadly to refer to essentially any abdominal bowel fistula. So for example, a what's more properly a gastrocutaneous fistula, which would be a connection between the stomach in the skin, um, or a colocutaneous fistula, which would be between the colon and the skin, uh, would be also referred to as enterocutaneous fistulas often. So really, big picture, an EC fistula is just a connection between the bowel and the skin that usually ends up with bowel contents being leaked out onto the abdominal wall. So why do these fistulas form? Usually, they're the result of an unfortunate complication of intestinal surgery. So you can imagine any time you hook up two loops, loops of bowel together, if this connection isn't perfect, things leak out. If this is the skin, uh, this collection of leaked bowel contents can grow and grow and grow and eventually find its way to the skin. And if it forms a tract here that leads to the contents leaking out outside of the body, that is an enterocutaneous fistula. So, of course, that is not an ideal situation. But it's important to remember that not all fistulas are bad. If you recall back to our dialysis access fistula, you'll remember that an AV fistula, again, it's all in the name, two things that are connected, then the word fistula, an AV fistula, arteriovenous fistula, is actually the best type of dialysis access. Other examples, anybody that's ever needed an ostomy after an intestinal surgery, that is a surgically created intentional connection between the bowel and the skin of the abdominal wall. And finally, for example, things like G-tubes or J-tubes that we talked about in our surgical tubes video uh, are very important tools to give people enteral feeding access. That's crucial for, um, really, nutrition is just crucial for life, but also uh, crucial for recovering from surgery well. Those tubes are, in fact, uh, or let's say a G-tube, that's just a gastrocutaneous enteral fistula. Now, that said, this talk will focus more on the problematic fistulas and how we treat them, but it's important to remember that not all fistulas are bad, and the same principles that apply to fistulas we want apply to fistulas we don't want. And you can use those principles to either uh, promote the fistula that you want to stay or to get rid of a fistula that you want to uh, treat. So, now, this is the mnemonic or the common pimp question, the friends of the fistula. So friends of the fistula are names of several factors that go to promote fistula formation. And remember, these factors can be good or bad uh, if they're supporting a fistula that you want or don't want. So first, F. This stands for foreign body. Uh, in a negative situation, this might be um, some sort of retained suture or foreign object like a mesh that erodes into the bowel and causes a fistula. But in a positive sense, a foreign body could be like a G-tube. That tube is a foreign body that keeps that tract between the stomach and the skin open. So foreign body. R stands for radiation. That's not really a modifiable factor, but it is something to keep in mind. I stands for infection or inflammation. Uh, one particular part of of inflammation that you can think of as IBD or inflammatory bowel disease. Specifically, Crohn's is a very common, there's disease processes just called fistulas and Crohn's, where fistulas are kind of the main complication of that disease. But remember, overall, this just stands for inflammation broadly. E stands for epithelialization, uh, which just refers to that fistula tract that's been created, developing an epithelium on it. Um, the way this can be clinically applicable 
applicable is anytime you're treating, for example, an anorectal fistula, uh, you often want to curette that fistula tract to help it scar down and heal as part of the surgery you're doing. N stands for neoplasm or cancer. For example, if you have somebody that presents as, quote, perforated diverticulitis, this, it's important to keep in mind that this could be actually a perforated colon cancer because neoplasms often lead to fistula. So again, that helps explain some clinical decision-making. D stands for distal obstruction. Now this I found confusing as a medical student, so I'm gonna make this very clear. So if you have bowel, and at some point in the bowel, you have a narrowing or an obstruction, then the pressure is going to build up here proximal to that obstruction. And the more pressure there is, the more likely that bowel contents is to leak out and form a fistula to some other location. So if you have a distal obstruction, um, and if you have an enterocutaneous fistula that you want to treat and there's a distal obstruction, you must treat that fistula. This is, for example, the reason why anytime someone has an ostomy, before you take down that ostomy, you almost always want to study that distal rectal pouch or Hartman's pouch, et cetera, because if there's any strictures there, you'll hook those two together and not realize you have a stricture. And then that pressure is going to build up at your anastomosis where you've hooked the two pieces of bowel together and oftentimes lead to a leak and the dreaded complication of an enterocutaneous fistula. And the final S is steroids. Um, again, not really modifiable, kind of like radiation. If people are on steroids, they probably really need to be on them, but it's just something to keep in mind. All right, so we talked about the friends of the fistula. Maybe we should just quick review. Foreign object, radiation, inflammation or infection, epithelialization, neoplasm, distal obstruction, and steroids. And now a little bit more vocabulary we need to know about EC fistulas is whether they're high or low output because this goes into management and also tells you a little bit about where the fistula likely comes from. So first, just some numbers. A high output fistula typically puts out greater than 500 cc's of output per day, where a low output typically gives out less than 200 cc's. Now you might wonder, is something in between the two a moderate output fistula? And people don't really talk about those, so just ignore that. Um, and so what this tells you, one, is how likely is it to heal? So a high output is less likely to heal than a low output. You can imagine there's stuff going through there all the time, kind of keeping it open. And two, this can give you a little bit of a hint while you're still figuring things out about where this fistula is coming from. So if you imagine that your whole GI tract is this long tube that absorbs fluid, you can imagine that there's more fluid at the top of the GI tract than there is at the bottom, uh, where ideally there's normal stool coming out. So a fistula up here by the stomach or the jejunum is going to have a lot of fluid coming out because there's not been much time for your body to reabsorb that fluid. Whereas a colocutaneous fistula often will just have a much lower output because there's less passage of fluid through that area. All right, so why do we not like enterocutaneous fistulas? Besides the obvious that it's kind of gross to have intestinal contents leaking onto your stomach all the time. Uh, there are some really serious complications related to especially high output fistulas. If you're losing a ton of fluid out of that fistula, you can get really, really dehydrated. People actually can't drink enough to keep up with their losses from these fistulas. And along with fluid losses come really severe electrolyte abnormalities, which can, in the worst case situation, lead to arrhythmias and death. And secondly, if these are really proximal fistulas, people might not be able to get enough nutrition just because there's not enough of their food going through their GI tract to be absorbed. So keep those in mind when we talk about treatment, these issues being uh, fluid losses, electrolyte abnormalities, and the need for adequate nutrition. All right, so keeping those in mind, if we want to treat an EC fistula, what are our goals of treatment? Our first goal is to reduce the output and protect the skin uh, around the fistula. So protecting the skin, that's really not something to focus on. Basically, you just beg the fistula and make sure you're not leaking stomach acid or something on your skin. But the major goal is reducing output. And in fact, if you reduce the output well enough, you never progress to step number two. And we'll talk about why that is. But so goal number one is reduce output. If you reduce the output enough, the body will often heal itself and you won't have to go on to step two at all. Uh, in fact, there's some fistulas that they're so low output already that you don't even have to reduce the output and they'll just heal on their own. And when you think about this, it's also important that kind of a step 1A is to control sepsis. Technically, if there's 
free spillage of bowel contents into the abdomen. That's not actually a fistula at all, right? There's not a tract made. Uh, but a lot of times these fistulas will come with small pockets of infection that didn't actually drain out of the body. So if there are infections, the patient's sick from that, you certainly want to control sepsis, usually with IR drains of infected fluid collections. All right, so how do we do step one? How do we reduce output of these fistulas? You have a few options. One is to just stop eating. Of course, you can't do this for forever, uh, but a few days of bowel rest and a low output fistula might be enough to get you through and get that thing to start healing up. Of course, if you do this for much longer than just a few days, you need to start that patient on TPN. TPN stands for total parenteral nutrition, which just means nutrition through an IV. Now that's all well and good, but TPN has a bunch of complications related to it, both related to getting your nutrition in an unnatural way and the sort of central lines that you require to get TPN. So this is not a great long-term option if you can avoid it, but it is an option. And then finally, you can use medications to reduce output. And if you think about how your GI tract is producing liters and liters of fluid per day, even if you stop eating, you're going to still have a lot of output. So sometimes these medications can help. And the way I think about the different classes of medications are we have medications that slow the bowels. So for example, loperamide or diphenoxalate, uh, you might know it more as lamotyl, uh, tincture of opium, etc. cetera. Uh, there's also medications that decrease secretions specifically from the stomach, for example, PPIs and H2 blockers. And then finally, there's others that decrease kind of broadly intestinal secretions, including things like pancreatic secretions, for example, somatostatin or its synthetic form, octreotide. And so again, we're thinking about this in terms of if we reduce the output enough, one, the patient's not going to get sick from getting really dehydrated, um, and two, they're likely to be able to heal that fistula on their own. But you might ask, why don't we just fix the fistula? Why go through all that work when you could, in theory, just go in and place a stent across the fistula or do some sort of operation where you cut out the fistula and just hook things back together? And the problem is these things are not easy. Remember, think about what caused the fistula in the first place. Oftentimes, it was a complication of a surgery that certainly did not intend to cause a fistula, or it was caused by a foreign body, of which a stent is an example. So you got to be really careful that in your surgery or your other type of treatment where you go into mechanically fix the fistula, you don't end up making things worse. And these surgeries are often extremely difficult. You can imagine that a, a tract of GI contents is going to be associated with a ton of focal inflammation um, and adhesions to surrounding tissue that makes surgery extremely difficult. And you're actually quite likely to make other bowel injuries during the surgery. And those could create more fistulas and you end up spinning your wheels and putting these patients through operations without any benefit. And so because these surgeries are so dangerous and so difficult uh, and so fraught with complications, only if the fistula is not healing would you ever even consider a surgery. And most people that I've talked to that operate on these say they wait at least nine months to a year for the inflammation to go down before they would even offer an operation. So you would give all those medications, you'd maybe be on TPN for a while, do everything you can to slow stuff down. If it's not healing and still high output, they have to live like that kind of miserable for a year, taking those medications, begging their fistula, etc. Uh, but it's that important for the inflammation to go down for that surgery to be safe before you go back in there again. Otherwise, you can just make things worse. All right, so kind of a whirlwind topic. I was not actually expecting to have this much to say about EC fistulas, but a quick review. So what is an EC fistula? EC fistula stands for enterocutaneous fistula. This broadly refers to a connection between the bowel and the uh, skin. Remember, technically, EC would stand for small intestine to skin fistula, but it also tends to encompass gastro or colocutaneous fistulas as well. What is the Friends mnemonic? F, foreign body. R, radiation. I, inflammation or infection. E, epithelialization. N, neoplasm. D, distal obstruction. And S, steroids. If we're treating one of these fistulas, what do we do? Uh, we reduce the output, and we hope it heals on its own. And very rarely do we do an operation. And remember, if there's any of those friends of the fistula in place that you can resolve, for example, taking care of a distal obstruction, removing a foreign body from a tract, etc., you do that. And I think that's it. So this video is for educational purposes only. Do not use to diagnose or treat any diseases, and we will see you next time.